All right, the book of Proverbs. Now, as we get started in this book, it's important to note, I'm really excited that we're getting involved in this book. The book of Proverbs, in the very first chapter, it's going to outline what the whole book is about and the whole purpose for the book of Proverbs. Look at verse number one. The Bible reads, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. So, of course, this is David's son Solomon who's penning down almost all of the Proverbs are from the hand of Solomon. Of course, it's still inspired by God. It's the word of God that we believe. These are God's words, but he used Solomon to, uh, to pen down the vast majority of these in the book of Proverbs. And verse number two says, so these are the Proverbs of Solomon, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. The, the, the main purpose of the book of Proverbs, and as you read this, it's to gain knowledge. It's to really increase your learning and to get instruction. I mean, you think about, um, I know I have four children, and when we get a new toy for them or whatever, they come with instructions, right? There's this manual, and it's, okay, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, and they put everything in order. Those are instructions, right? Well, we have in the book of Proverbs are a set of instructions not to build some toy, but for our lives. The way that God is lined up, it, it's, it's a wise way to live. There's going to be a lot of references to different sins. There's going to be a lot of references to just how we ought to live our life, decisions that we should be making, things that we need to be staying away from all throughout the book of Proverbs. So if you want you know, the instruction manual, I hear frequently, oh, life is not, doesn't come with an instruction manual. Well, well, here's an instruction manual for your life right here in the book of Proverbs. And... Um, I, I've done this, sometimes I do this and sometimes I don't, I kind of go back and forth, but I know one thing that a lot of people do, and I like it a lot, is people read the proverb of the day. So the book of Proverbs has 31 chapters, and basically the way that you do the proverb of the day is, it's not one verse, it's one chapter, so whatever day of the week it is, today is, um, what's today's date, the 11th, right? So today, what you do, if you're reading the proverb of the day, you just read all of chapter 11, Tomorrow you read chapter 12. The next day you read chapter 13. And, you know, if there's months where there's 30 days, you read through the first 30 chapters. And if you want to, you could read that 31 on that last day. Or in days where there's 31 days, obviously, you read every single chapter. And um, this is something that's good to do. Why? Because it's going to give you wisdom. It's going to give you that instruction. These are, the, the book of Proverbs has a lot of very, um, you know, I hate to use the word relevant, but uh, it is very relevant to our lives. This is very clear instructions. You know, these aren't like parables. This is, this is just given to us like just pure instruction and wisdom. And, and if we can just model our life based on the great wisdom found in the Proverbs, you would do very well. So he says here in verse 2, you know, it's to know wisdom, it's to get instruction, to perceive the words of our soul. It's to help you understand the words of knowledge. It's to help you gain that understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom. Look at this, justice. I just preach on justice on Sunday, knowing what's right and what's just. It says in judgment and equity, things that are equal. It's, it's knowing what's right from God. See, we live in a world where people are always trying to tell you what's right and what's wrong and their version of morality. And see, the world's version of morality is different than God's version of morality. And if we want to know what's true and right in God's eyes, we can only get it from one source. It's from this book. And it's important to get that information for yourself every day. There's a lot of different religions out there. There's a lot of different preachers out there. There's all kinds of people. You can't just rely on the preacher to spoon feed you what is right and what is wrong. God has given us his word for all of us to be able to read, for all of us to be able to understand. And the book of Proverbs, next excellent source for that, and that's the whole point of why Proverbs was written, so that we could understand what's just, we could understand what's right. It says to give subtlety to the simple. Now, what, now when the Bible uses the word simple, it basically means someone who's stupid, someone who's ignorant, someone who doesn't have very much knowledge. If you are someone who, who lacks knowledge, lacks intellect, Someone who's not able to really understand things easily. And look, I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize you if that's the way you are, if you've had a problem kind of understanding things, you've never been very good at school. But see, God does want us to be intelligent. He wants you to understand things. And I guarantee you, if you just get your head in this book of Proverbs, you just read it over and over again, it will help you to become wise. It'll help you to become smarter. Now, I'm not saying you're going to get an A on a math test, 
but you will have the wisdom that's going to matter most in your life on the decisions that you make. And when you think back of, of all the decisions that you've made in your life, especially those of us that are older, you have, you know, you've made some really, really bad decisions. I know I have, and you've made some really good decisions. And this book, this book of Proverbs especially, will help you to make the right decision, to give you that instruction. And when you, when you start reading it, especially if you've already made a bunch of bad decisions, you're like, oh, yep, I've done that, yep, I've done that, and you learn the hard way. Well, let's not learn the hard way anymore. Let's, let's stop making mistakes the hard way. Let's just learn and trust and have faith in God's Word that even if I don't have to go through, look, I don't have to go through these things to know that this is right, that I'll just stay away from it. And especially the kids, you know, listen up because this is important for you. There's a lot of things you haven't gone through in your life. And the Bible talks a lot about, we're going to get into in later chapters where it talks about drinking alcohol, for example. You know, you don't ever have to drink a drop of alcohol to know that it's going to cause a lot of misery and destruction in your life. It's going to cause you to do a lot of stupid things. And you make a lot of poor decisions when you get involved in stuff like that. Okay, the book of Proverbs goes over that. The book of Proverbs goes over fornication and adultery and getting involved with people you shouldn't be getting involved with. The strange woman who's there looking for, you know, to destroy the, the innocent and the precious life. It gives you instruction. We're going to get into all of that through our series here going through the book of Proverbs. But this is extremely important. If you are lacking some understanding, hey, come to all of our Wednesday night service. Get into this book for yourself. Start reading the proverb of the day and get this instruction. It says they're finishing up in verse 4, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Hey, this is great for kids. I encourage the kids to always be reading this book to give them that wisdom so you don't have to learn by doing. You could learn by just reading and seeing, hey, yeah, this is, this is what the Bible says. This is how I should be living my life. Let's continue on here. Verse number five. The Bible reads, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. So what that's saying is, if you're wise, you're going to hear, you're going to listen, and you're going to increase your learning. The problem that a lot of people have with the Bible is they don't like what it says in many places. And they don't want to hear. And they don't have anything to do with it. But see, you have to come from the starting point, first of all, of being saved, of having your faith in Christ and knowing that this is the Word of God. See, the world that doesn't believe in Christ, they're going to think this is foolish. Of course they're going to hate it. They're not going to want to hear it. But if you're a believer, if you believe that these are the words of God, if you're wise, you're going to hear and there's many, many times, believe me, I understand, I know, when you might hear something and you're like, oh man, that kind of hurts, it stings a little bit. Why? Because you're maybe guilty of that. You know, there, there's, there's, none of us here is perfect. There's always areas of our life that we're working on. And believe it or not, even myself, sometimes while I'm preaching, there's things that'll be stinging in my own heart, like, oh man, like, that just has come to me, like, I need to work on that. Okay, and it's, it, this, is, this is for everybody. We're all human. We're all in the same boat of not being perfect individuals, and we all need the instruction of God. And if you're wise, you'll be able to receive. You'll be able to hear God's word. You'll be able to accept it, soften up your heart, and just be ready and willing to say, God, here I am. I'm not perfect, but I'm willing to change to do what's right when I understand what is right here. So the wise man's going to hear, but they're going to increase their learning because they're going to do what's right. They're going to they're want to do what's right. And then um, it says, a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Wise counsels is receiving more wisdom and advice from other people. When you get counsel from someone, you're kind of bouncing something off of them. So it says, if you have understanding, you're going to attain unto wise, and not, not foolish counsels, right? It's not just, oh, I'm going to ask a whole bunch of people what I should do in this situation, because you don't want the counsel of a fool. You're going to attain unto wise counsel. You're going to go to someone who says, you know, here's somebody who I can see in their life. They've made a lot of changes. They seem to be following God. They seem to know their Bible very well. They seem to have very wise counsel. That is who I am going to go to when I have certain questions or problems in my life or something. I even want to just, just hear what they have to say about it. A man of understanding will find someone with wise counsel to kind of get some feedback from. That's what the Bible says here. Look at verse number six. To understand a proverb and the interpretation the words of the wise and their dark sayings. So let's see, verse number seven. That's what, those first six verses are all defining what the book of Proverbs is about. 
Verse number seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is pretty much what I was just saying. You know, people who don't want to hear the Bible, they don't want to hear what God has to say. The Bible calls them a fool. They despise wisdom. They hate the word of God. They don't want anything to do with it, and they despise the wisdom and instruction that you'll get from God's word. But the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, I'm going to park it on this verse just for a few minutes here. Keep a, a, a bookmark here. Keep your finger in Proverbs chapter 1. We're coming back to it. Flip back, if you would, to Revelation chapter 21. All the way at the end of the Bible, it's the second to last chapter in the whole Bible, Revelation chapter 21. Some people hear that, the fear of the Lord. What do you mean, the fear of the Lord? I've got to fear God? Say, well, I thought God's all loving, and, and, and you know, why, would I, why would I have to fear a loving God? What, that doesn't make any sense to me. What, and, and this is, this is a, a way of thinking that a lot of people have today because, unfortunately, there's been too much preaching and teaching that's lopsided, that's just completely one-sided of, of the, God's aspect of being loving and merciful, which, praise the Lord that He is. But that's not all he is. God also has anger and wrath and he's someone to be feared. And all throughout the Bible, what you'll see, whenever anybody is in the presence of the Lord, when you read the Old Testament, you read those prophets, you read of people like Moses, right? A righteous guy. When they're in the presence of God, they fall down flat on their face in trembling and in fear in the, in the, in the presence of the power of the Almighty God. Right. We have a tendency to forget that aspect of God and how powerful He is. And when you read about people, you know, when, when God comes, there's this great rushing of a mighty wind and an earthquake and a fire and all these things, you know, all these great events when God is just kind of making His presence known. And the best way I could probably explain it is if you've ever been in a very serious storm or like by a tornado or, or an earthquake, you know, some major natural event where you know everything's out of your control. <laughs> you're just like, God, please get me through this. You know, you're, you're, the wind's whipping around and you're outside and there's lightning striking. You know, you know, those types of events, that, that fear that you could feel from that, that is like similar to the fear of God that we ought to have because God is all powerful. God holds our breath in, our, in his hand. And we need to recognize that and remember that. And as much love and, and, and mercy that God has, and again, thank God for that. I love that aspect of God. We cannot get so focused and one sided of God that that's all we ever talk about or think about or anything. We need to recognize the fact that God also has anger and wrath. And we do need to have a fear of the Lord. The Bible says right here in Scripture, the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of knowledge. That's where you start. Right. Now, the Bible says that you know, perfect love casteth out fear. Okay, so when you could get to the point to where you can walk perfect before God and you are completely upright and you know, essentially just without sin, you have no reason to fear God. And that is absolutely true. But as long as we are not perfect, we don't have that perfect love. Because the Bible says, you know, Jesus Christ himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the way that we show our love to God is by obeying him, by listening to his rules. And when we sin, we're not keeping his commandments. So if we have perfect love, we will be keeping his commandments perfectly. And as long as we're not doing that, we don't have perfect love. And the perfect love is what casts out fear. So we always are going to have, while we're in this body, while we're in this sinful flesh, a reason to have a healthy fear of God. The same way that my children need to have a healthy fear of me. Now, I love my children to no end. And anyone that knows me and knows my family can, can see that. And my children love me. But as much as they love me and as much as I love them, they need to have a proper fear that, you know, when they cross the line, when they start acting up and disobeying, that guess what? A punishment is coming and it's not going to feel very good. And God is our loving Father. We need that same healthy fear that if we decide to be rebellious, say, God, I don't want to listen to what you got for me. I don't want to hear it, God. I've heard it before. I just want to do what I want to do. I'm just going to have a few beers, God, all right? This is just what I want to do. 
Just leave me alone. It's not a healthy fear of God. We ought to have that. Because God is capable of making all kinds of things happen in our life. He's going to make sure, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Okay? Don't deceive yourself. Don't trick yourself into thinking that just because you're a child of God, that you can just get away with anything. Right? Just like my kids. Just because they're my, I'm their father, they're not going to get away with everything. We need to keep that healthy fear. And that's the beginning of knowledge. See, when, especially for, for new believers, when you first get saved, the Bible refers to you as a babe in Christ. You don't know that much. There's a lot of things you need to learn. You're a newborn creature. You, 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 you your, you're born again. And praise the Lord, you're a child of God and you will always be a child of God. But you need to grow. You need to learn. And the beginning of knowledge, just that understanding and say, you know what? I may not even understand why God has all these different rules. But I know that I better just keep them. And it's the same way with my children. They don't have to understand all of the various reasons. Especially like my two-year-old doesn't need to understand why she can't go running off into the street. As long as she knows that if she tries to do that, she's going to get punished. She's going to have a discipline. That's all she has to understand at this point. As she gets older, she could understand, oh, dad didn't want me going out in the street because he doesn't want me getting hit by a car and dying. Right? It's for my own benefit. They don't always have to understand all of the reasoning and the benefits for the rules that we set up for them as long as they can start off with the proper fear of knowing that, hey, there are consequences for our actions. It's the same way with us. You don't have to understand all of the reasoning behind God's rules, which, honestly, they're not that difficult. But for some people, you could look at something, I don't know, why, why do we have to do that? I don't know, I don't get it. Let's just keep a healthy fear of God. That's the beginning of knowledge. We're just saying, well, I'm just, you know, the Bible says it, so I'm just not going to do it. And that's where knowledge starts. That's not the end of knowledge. That's just the beginning. But the fool doesn't even want that much. They'll hear the instruction and cast it out and despise it and not want to have anything to do with it. You got to turn to Revelation 21. So I'm going to talk about having a fear of God because a lot of people, it's, it's kind of a foreign concept of fearing God. I think that analogy will help you to understand what we're even talking about here, having a fear of God. But the Bible tells us in Revelation 21.8, I use this out soul winning all the time because there's this big list of sins. I like to ask people, you know, what do you think a person would have to do in order for God to send them to hell? Right? What, what, what's bad enough in God's eyes for you to deserve just burning in hell forever and ever and ever? And most people will say something like murder, you know, something that's just, just a really bad sin. They'll say, yeah, you know, if you murder someone, that's bad enough for God to send you to hell. Which is why we show them Revelation 21.8. In Revelation 21.8, it lists all these different things, which includes murderers. But then we point out, it says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we're saying, look, even telling a lie is bad enough in God's eyes to deserve a punishment of hell. And, you know, it's important to get that point across, but one of the things we don't really point out very often, and what I think people read over is the very first three words there, but the fearful. Even being fearful, according to the Bible, is a sin. According to this verse right here. Now, when it says fearful, the only exception to being fearful is having the fear of the Lord. All throughout the Bible, you will find this consistently, that God tells us not to fear, not to fear. Be not afraid. I looked up the, just the single phrase, be not afraid. Fear not in the Bible. And it, it occurs, you know, I forgot, like 70 times. Of just fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. Over and over again, we are admonished, don't be afraid. The only time we are told to fear at all is when we fear God. That is the only fear that God wants us to have. Um, I'll just read these for you. You can flip back to Proverbs chapter 1. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible reads, For God has, hath not given us the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear, when we're fearful, that doesn't come from God. He says, But of power and of love and of a sound mind. We have a lot of things that come up in our life that may make us afraid. You may be faced with... Uh, a medical problem. You, you know, you're, you're faced with cancer. You're faced with something that's, wow. 
And, and, and a lot of people are fearful when that happens. And I could understand why. Obviously, you know, it makes sense why people would be afraid. But the Bible's telling us you don't have to be afraid of that. You could be fearful of, wow, I just lost my job and I have to, to, to feed my family and I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and you start getting afraid. The Bible says you don't have to fear that either. There are so many things that can come up in our life that we could be fearful of. But the reason why we don't have to be afraid of anything in this life is because we have faith in God, because we have a heavenly Father that loves us. Amen. So it's the same reason that why my children, other than just being afraid of me, they don't have to be afraid of anything else. When they're in my house, they don't have to fear someone coming in and doing anything to them because I'm there to protect them. I'm there to watch out for them. They don't have to fear anything bad happening to them. They don't have to fear having food on their plate because guess what? I'm going to make sure that there gets food on their plate. They don't have to fear the rent being, you know, the mortgage being paid. I'm going to work hard enough to make sure that it happens. You know, there's nothing that they have to fear other than just making sure they're obeying me. And that's it. And it's the same way with God. We don't have to fear what man can do to us. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus Christ himself said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And Jesus is giving us this admonishment because what happens is when you live the Christian life, there's a lot of people that hate it. And all throughout history, you find people who have been martyred for the cause of Christ. People have lost their lives and even lost their lives in gruesome ways. I mean, Jesus himself was crucified on the cross. I don't know if you know this, but that's not the most pleasant way to die. To be nailed up to a cross and be hanging there. And the way that it, that it happens, I'm not going to get too graphic, but as he's hanging there, it makes it extremely difficult to breathe the way that they're hanging with, with all of your body weight pressing down like that and then having nails, you know, obviously uh, struck through the, the hands and the feet to the point to where you basically die of suffocation in many cases. That's what I was reading about that. Obviously, it's not a common practice today for people to be crucified. But the, the amount of pain and anguish and, and Jesus Christ recording, you know, he was thirsty and they gave him that vinegar to drink just, just added insult to injury there when his mouth was dry and his tongue was cleaving to the top of his throat and, and you know, he was able to see his bones of his ribs. He was able to count those because they beat him so bad and beaten and bloody. And that's a horrible way to die. But even if you're facing that, he says, fear not what man can do unto you then don't be afraid of that. If it happens, there's a purpose for it. God will allow those things to happen and he won't allow us to go through anything that we're not able to handle. With every temptation, there's a way out. But what we need to make sure is that we obey God rather than men. That we need to just have that healthy fear of God. And if we have that, we have no reason to be afraid of anything else. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs 1, verse number 8. My son, and, and you'll notice this throughout the book of Proverbs also, especially in the first like eight or nine chapters, it, it's constantly my son, my son, my son. And again, another importance of letting the children hear and get this wisdom. Solomon is, is giving all this advice and this instruction unto his son, saying, my son, you need to know these things. My son, this is important for you to learn. And it's so important for our children to grow up receiving this knowledge. Right. Too many people get too busy in this world. The mom's at work, the dad's at work. They throw the kid in school and nobody is taking the time to sit them down and teach them God's word and instruct them and say, this is extremely important. You need to learn this. And it takes time to do that. It's not easy to do that. It's, it takes time. It's sometimes, especially these days, it's hard to get kids' attention because unfortunately we're, we're giving them all these different devices and all, you know, all these iPods and iPads and, and computers and laptops and all these other electronics that they can't focus on anything because they need to have all these videos going and sounds and flashing. And, and if, it's, if it's just like a regular book, if we're just sitting down and talking, they're going to get bored. Well, I'll tell you what. If that's the way your child is, you need to get them to change. You need to be able to make some time. Take the time to instruct them properly, to sit down and be able to hear and to listen. And look, I know it's not easy. I've never said it was. I won't claim that it is. 
I still, you know, with my four little ones, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort, but it's important. Amen. These words, this instruction that you receive from the Bible is going to stay with those children forever. And these, these are the, 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 this is the knowledge that we need to have to base all of our decisions on in our life. And this is there to help guide them throughout their entire life and us as adults. It's no less important for us, but it's so important to instill this. The younger you can get this great wisdom and instruction, the less mistakes, Lord willing, that they'll make. There's so many things. Had I just known how God felt about these things, there are so many mistakes I would not have made in my life. Just even knowing it, because people are told today the, the, the philosophy of the world, for example, with fornication, people are just told like, well, if you love somebody, then yeah, go ahead. And then you could just, you could have that physical relationship. These days, it's like marriage means almost nothing. I mean, look at how many people are getting divorced anyways. To the kids are growing up and seeing this. Well, who, what, what does marriage mean? Right. I mean, over half of the people are just getting divorced anyways. They're bouncing around from person to person. What is it even? Why should I have to wait? Well, the reason why I have to wait is because God hates divorce, and God also hates fornication. And it is a very, very serious sin. And again, we'll be getting into all of that as we get into these later chapters. It's just one example. But if kids could just understand this early on of how much God doesn't like fornication, you know, they could, they could grow up learning this and, and hopefully it'll just stay at the back of their minds as they get into their teenage years and as they start to date and as they start to meet other people and maybe a temptation arises, they could think back and say, no, you know, I can't do this because I want to stay true to God. I want, I, there, there's a reason why I shouldn't be doing this. And even if you don't completely understand 100% now, let's have that fear of the Lord and have that healthy knowledge. Let's keep reading here. Verse number, yeah, verse 7, he says, uh, or verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. And if you're a mother or father, you ought to have laws for your children. You ought to have instructions for your children. Verse number 9, For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. They're good for you. There's something that's, that's good for you to have, all this, this, this wisdom and knowledge. You think about an ornament or chains are there to, to beautify you, right? It's something that, that, that you, you'll have as, a, as an ornament. Well, having that wisdom is the best ornament that you can have. Having that knowledge is going to um, just help you in every aspect of your life. It's so important to get this knowledge. Verse number 10, we're going to transition here in the book of Proverbs, chapter 1. She's going to bring up a specific example here. And it's a warning. It's a warning unto children. Verse number 10, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And this is extremely important, especially for the younger generation, for the younger kids. When peer pressure is involved, when you're around a group of kids, and especially series of one sinners, you know, the bad kids. Oh, hey, come on, come on. And, and, you know, usually the bad kids are also perceived as being the cool kids. Right? They're the ones that everyone looks to. Oh, man, they're the, they're the, the bad group and they're, they're real cool. And they've invited me along to go with them. And you want to be accepted by all of your peers. And you want to look into that and say, wow, this cool person invited me to be along. And then they tell you, hey, we've got this plan and we want you to be a part of it. Let's keep reading here. He says, if they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. He's saying, there are people out there that are going to be plotting. And there may be a group of people. And they invite you in and say, hey, Come with us. We've got this plan. It's all worked out. We're going to get all this money. We're going to get all this stuff. We're going to get these game systems. We're going to rob this person. Okay? We're going to lie and wait. We're going to secretly just wait for them. We're going to wait for them to leave their house. We're going to wait for it to be nighttime. We're going we're to break into their house. Don't worry about it. Look at There's five of us here. We're going to go in. We can take that person down. That's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Come with us. Cast in thy lot with us. Hey, we're all going to have one purse. It means whatever we get out of there, whatever we take, we're all split it equally. We're all in this together. It's like a gang. 
You need to make sure that you are, have the inner strength, that you have the boldness to say, I'm not going to consent, I'm not going to go with you. Now, oftentimes, this may come as a, you know, people might look at you funny or say, I don't want people to make fun of me because I didn't go along with the cool kids. That is way better to have people maybe say things like that than for you to go along and commit such wicked sins just because they're trying to pressure you into doing it. You need to make sure that you're grounded and founded and know what's right and wrong. And when you are sensing that people are trying to do something that's wrong, something you've already learned, hey, we shouldn't be doing this. This is not something to do that you could have the strength to not do it, to be able to stand alone and to leave the situation, have nothing to do with them. Don't be consensual. Don't say, yeah, I'll do that with you, just to go along for whatever reason that may be. Because we're going to see why. We're going to see the end of those people. We're going to see what actually happens. Yeah, it may sound all good. They have this great plan. No one will ever know about it. We'll get all of this cool stuff. We don't even have to work for it. All we got to do is steal it from this other person. Verse 13, we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. We're going to get all this great stuff. And they're going to try to get that in your mind to think, wow, yeah, I've always wanted to have these things. Let's just take it. Verse 14, cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them, refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. He's saying, it's vain for you to, to if you're going to trap birds and you set out the, the, the trap for them like while they're watching you, they're not, they're not going to fall for it, right? You can't, you can't set the trap while they're watching you. He's saying, surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird and they lay wait for their own blood and lurk privily for their own lives. So what he's referring to when he's making that, that analogy there of, of setting a trap for a bird when these people are trying to set a trap for somebody else and they're going to go steal from them and they're going to you know, hurt them or kill them or whatever and do whatever it takes for them to get all that stuff, they're like the person setting a trap inside of the bird. Why? Because God sees them. Because God's the one that will recompense. God's the one that's going to make sure that it's going to come back on their own heads. He says, they wait for their own blood. They're, they're there and it's basically they've just set a trap for themselves. And that is going to be their end. They think they're so smart. They think they've got it all figured out. And they're going to get away with it. You don't get away with anything in God's eyes. That's right. God makes sure that everything is always repaid. So kids, don't ever think that you could just get away with stuff. Because whether your mom sees, whether your dad sees, doesn't matter because God sees everything. You can't hide anything from him. And he'll make sure that justice is served. Verse number 18, or verse number 19, So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. And that lines up perfectly with um, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, you don't have to try. I'll, I'll read it for you. It's a real famous passage in 1 Timothy chapter 6 right here. Because it's saying people who are greedy of gain. It's someone that's just, they, they have their heart set on making money and they'll do anything for it. It says, which taketh away the life of the owners of. They're willing to kill just so that they can have more stuff because they're so greedy of having that money. 1 Timothy 6 verse 8 says, And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. See, if you're content with what you have, you're not going to be greedy of what someone else has. You're not going to be getting involved in the situation in the first place if you could learn just to be happy with the things that you have. I mean, what in the world do you need more money for if you're already happy where you're at. It doesn't matter where you're at. The Bible doesn't teach you be content if you have the nice house and cars and everything else. No, the Bible says be content with such things as you have. Now, not everyone has the same amount of stuff, but is this life all about stuff? I mean, is that, is that, is that how you win at this life is just having the most stuff? Having stuff is empty. And the more stuff you get, the more stuff you're going to want. And the more you're going to realize that you may have that temporary moment of pleasure, but it's going to leave you empty anyways. Yeah. 
if you can just be content with what you've got, you're going to lead a much more fulfilling, happy, enjoyable life, even if you have almost nothing. And having food and raiment. It doesn't say, it doesn't say having a house. Food and clothing. If you are able to feed yourself and be dressed, he says, be there with content. I mean, think about that. That is talking about someone who is homeless. Being content with what they have as long as they could eat and as long as they have clothing on their body. And God has promised both of those things to us. God has promised that he will provide food and clothing for us. And if God's going to take care of that, what do we have to worry about? We can be content with, we ought to be content with those things. Most people aren't content with those things, but we ought to be content with those things. It says, but they that will be rich, those people who want to be rich, who their goal is to make a whole bunch of money and just to be rich, they that will be rich fall into temptation. It doesn't say they might fall. It says they fall into temptation and a snare. A snare is a trap. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. That desire, that want to just be rich, it's not going to just stop with being rich. It's going to lead you into all kinds of different lusts, all kinds of different appealing of your flesh that's going to drive you into all these different areas and you're going to end up drowning. I'll keep reading here. Verse 6, 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Loving money, having that greed, wanting to be rich. The Bible says that's the root of all evil. All evil stems from this desire to be rich. Why? Because the, the stronger that desire is, the more you're willing to hurt other people, the more you're willing to do whatever it takes to get that done, the less love you're going to have for someone else because you're just focused on yourself. And the more you're focused on yourself, the more sin you're going to get into. And that's why it's the root of all evil, of doing harm unto other people. It says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. That's where we ought to be. And that's what we saw in Proverbs 1. Again, it's the same exact thing. The ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners of, they're going to be the ones that are going to face destruction. They are going to be the ones that are pierced through with many sorrows. This is just wisdom for you. Look, you do what you want to do with your life. If you want to just work your, you know, build that business and, and, and build whatever it is just so you could be rich and you could own those houses and you could own those boats and you could own those cars, Go ahead and do it. But if you want to receive wisdom, you might want to rethink that plan and start being content with what you have and maybe refocus your plan. The Bible says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you in reference to the food, in reference to the clothing, saying, Look, I don't even know what I'm going to eat tomorrow. Don't worry about it. If you seek the kingdom of heaven first, if you just seek what God wants you to do first, God will take care of all those things for you. You don't even have to worry about them. And why do we have to worry about anything more than that anyways? The food and clothing that we need will sustain us from day to day. Anything else is just, you know, we're not being content with what we have. And if God blesses you, great. The Bible doesn't say it's a sin to have wealth or to have money. There are great men of God that had wealth. But you know what? Their focus and their goal and their aim wasn't to be rich. They just happened to be blessed of God. Their cattle happened to increase because God blessed them. They weren't just out and just focused solely on making money. And if God blesses you, great. Be content with that. And if God doesn't bless you with financial wealth, hey, be content with that. Amen. Proverbs 1, look at verse number 20. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Now, what I want to point out here is the Bible is, is personifying wisdom. Right? It's taking a concept, it's taking wisdom, it's taking knowledge, and equating that to a woman. Right? We'll say woman. Uh, wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. So wisdom is out there just 
in the streets, out there, uttering her voice, is, is making herself known. Wisdom's available. God's wisdom is available. People have an opportunity to hear from God. It's right here at your fingertips, walking up and down the streets. It's ready for you, but you need to be willing to listen. You need to have your ears ready. Wisdom is available and it's calling unto you. That's what it's saying here in Proverbs chapter 1. And just, just begging, how long? You simple, the, the, the ones that don't have wisdom, you don't have understanding, how long are you going to love just living in your simplicity and not knowing this stuff and just, and just living for your flesh and living for your fleshly appetites? And the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge. How long is that going to go on? God's just sitting there pleading, saying, look, I want you to learn. I want, I'm, I'm trying to give you this instruction. How long are you just going to withhold it from yourself? It's here. And here in the United States of America, today in 2016, God's wisdom is available, more available now probably than any other time throughout history. That's right. There are, you could go down to the Dollar Tree and get yourself an entire Bible for one dollar. It's available. I don't care if you're homeless, if you're begging on the streets, they get, you get a dollar. And you could use that dollar to have wisdom and instruction at your fingertips. But this is going to get very interesting here. So this is, this is talking about people saying, look, we're trying to get through to you. God's trying to reach everybody. The Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to get saved. He wants everyone to hear His wisdom and His instruction. But it's up to us to receive it. And we're going to see here an aspect of God as we keep reading here, Proverbs 1. Look at verse number 23. Turn you at my reproof. Now, a reproof is being told that you're wrong. You're being corrected. He's saying, turn. When I tell you that you're doing something wrong, change. He says, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. He says, if you just turn, if you listen to what I'm saying, if you turn, I'm going to pour out my spirit unto you. I'm going to bless you. I'll make my words known unto you. You'll receive so much, but you have to just receive when I tell you you're doing wrong and to change. But verse 24, he says, Because I have called and ye refused. He said, look, I've called unto you. And you heard, but you refused it. Because I called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. He's saying, you didn't want to have anything to do with me. I had my hands up. I'm willing to help you up. Jesus Christ is there. I'm willing to save you. Take my hand. And you put up your hand. Oh, nothing to do with that. People who reject God. This is what we're talking about now in Proverbs 1. The wisdom's there. God's calling on to him. God loves you. God wants you to be saved. But these people reject God. Look at what God does. It's woe to those people that refuse to hear. Verse number 26. I also will laugh at your calamity. When things start going really bad in your life, is what he's saying, that's what calamity is. He said, I'm going to laugh. So that's not very nice of you, God. That's what he said. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. See, usually when people reject God like that, they've got everything going for them. They've got everything great. I don't need God for anything. And that's the most proud people are the ones that, that also seem to be focused on building their wealth. Right? Remember, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. And the people that just do everything on their own. And there's nothing wrong with doing things on your own. There's nothing wrong with, with working hard. Look, I'm all for it. But when you just think that you've got everything settled and you don't need God for anything... Right. that's when, when the, the time to go, okay, are you going to keep rejecting me? You know, I've got my hand stretched out for you. You need me. You don't realize that you need me. I'm here to help you. I'm here to save you. I'm here to give you instruction, but you don't want to have anything to do with me. People could get a point, and I'm going to go over this concept. People could get to the point where they reject God, and they reject God, and they reject God, and they want to have nothing to do with Him. There gets a point where God will reject them. There is a, a philosophy out there where people will say it's never too late to turn to God. Yes, it is sometimes. 
Now, God is extremely long-suffering and merciful, and he is the God of the second chance and the third chance and the fourth chance. But you know what? He's not necessarily the God of the 1,000th chance. Okay, there is a point that we can get to. And I'm going to prove this to you from Scripture, so bear with me. We're going to go through the rest of Proverbs, but I've got a few more verses in the Bible we're going to turn to to kind of prove this concept of people just rejecting God and want to have nothing to do with them. Now, most people don't get to that point. Most people, even unbelievers, people who don't believe in Christ, they're not at the point where they just want to have nothing to do with God. So a lot of people just don't, they don't understand. They've never really read the Bible. They don't know much about it. That doesn't mean they're just completely rejecting and want to have nothing to do with God. But there are some people, and everyone in this room has probably met someone one time in their life that just hates God and wants to have nothing to do with them. And you get to the point where they're just like, no. And God says, look, I've given you an opportunity. I've given you multiple opportunities. I had my hand stretched out for you. But you have refused me. And he says, so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to laugh at your calamity. I'm going to mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, verse 27, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me. Look at this. But I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. He says, there's going to be a time now, all of a sudden, when they're brought down to nothing, now all of a sudden, they're going to be looking for me. They're going to be calling on me, but guess what? I'm not going to answer them. So you've done this to yourself. Now just enjoy it. This is the attitude that God has. Look, I didn't write the Bible. But this is something that we need to understand about God that we're learning wisdom and instruction from in the book of Proverbs. I didn't make him like this. This is who he is. Now, you could either, you know, like it or not, but this is an aspect of God that we need to realize. And, and that we make sure that we're not so haughty that we could just do whatever we want and that God might, not, you know, and think that God's not going to be upset with it because God's just love. You just come here at a time where, you know, you're facing your destruction. He's just going to mock you. He says, yeah, even when they call upon me, I'm, I'm not going to hear him. I'm not going to answer him. This disproves those that say it's never too late. For some people it is. Now, I'm not saying that we should be giving up on people necessarily, but there is a point that people can cross that where God will not always hear. Keep your finger here in Proverbs. We'll finish up. We're almost done. We're going to look at Luke chapter 9. I want you to see this for yourself in the scripture. We have one example of King Herod. Now, if you remember King Herod, King Herod was the king who beheaded John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was preaching. John the Baptist told Herod that it wasn't right, it wasn't lawful for him to have his brother's wife. Because what happened was his brother was married to this woman and they got a divorce or whatever, and then Herod wanted her and married her instead. And we don't know all the details of how that happened, but it doesn't matter. John the Baptist is saying, you know, that's not right. That's not lawful. God's saying you can't do that. And that made his wife really angry. So angry so that when, when her daughter danced before Herod, and he was well pleased, he says, whatever you want, under the half of the kingdom, I'll do it for you. She said, give me John the Baptist's head in the platter. And he said, okay. And he beheaded John the Baptist, the man of God, the greatest man that's ever lived, other than Jesus Christ. John the Baptist. And so he beheaded uh, uh, John the Baptist. This is that same Herod. So we're going to read about Herod now because when Jesus then was going to be crucified, he went before Pontius Pilate, of course, but Pilate also sent him to Herod. And this is kind of, I'm just giving you a little bit of backstory before we get into scripture here. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse number 7. Bible reads, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him in reference to Jesus. He's heard of everything that was done by Jesus, and he was perplexed. He was puzzled. You don't understand. Because that it was said of some that John was risen from the dead, and of some that Elias had appeared, and of others that one of the old prophets was risen again. And Herod said, John have I beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? And he desired to see him. So here we see a man, we see, we see Herod. He has a desire to see Jesus. He wants to see Jesus. He wants to hear from him. Flip over to Luke chapter 23. Now Jesus doesn't see him during this time. But, but this is after he's already beheaded John. He's saying, you know what? I've heard about this Jesus. I hear he's doing these miracles. I hear all this stuff. I want to meet him. I want to see him. And people say, Oh, what a great opportunity for Jesus to get King Herod saved, right? I mean, this great ruler and this great position of authority. Jesus could get him saved. How wonderful would that be? Look at Luke 23, verse number 7. 
This is now when Jesus is in front of Herod. Verse number 7, And as soon as he knew that he belonged under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod. Talking about Pontius Pilate sending him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Verse 8, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad. So he's, oh, finally I get to meet Jesus. For he was desirous to see him of a long season. He's been wanting to meet him for a long time because he had heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. So he's thinking, wow, I've heard of all these healings, all these other things. I want to see what this guy can do. I want to meet Jesus. Verse 9, Then he questioned with, me, with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. Jesus said nothing. He answered him not. Just like we saw in Proverbs chapter 1. You know what? There may be a time where you're going to want to talk to God. Herod had nothing to do with God. John the Baptist was there. He called unto him. He tried to give him instruction. He tried to give him wisdom. He wanted to have nothing to do with it. He had nothing to do with God. To the point to where he beheaded John the Baptist, an innocent man. He knew he didn't do anything worthy of death. He killed him anyways. And now he gets to a point, wow, now I want to seek Jesus. Now I want to hear from Jesus. Well, guess what, Herod? It's too late. You've missed your opportunity. You should have taken it with John the Baptist. It's too late for you. Jesus didn't open up his mouth and say a word. You say, but I thought Jesus wanted everyone to be saved. He did want everyone to be saved. But there gets to a point where you can become what the Bible refers to as a reprobate. The word reprobate means rejected, where you have been rejected by God. And this is an old teaching that isn't taught enough as it ought to be, but this is a point that someone could get to. Uh, Mark 8.15 says, And he charged them, saying, this is Jesus Christ, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Referring to Herod, the same Herod that was rejected. He was reprobate, saying, Beware of that. Beware of that leaven. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 12. We're almost done. We're going to turn to John chapter 12, and then we're going to finish up Proverbs, and we're done for the night. Proverbs, or John chapter 12, because you need to see this. What happens with a person who has become a reprobate, someone who has become rejected? Now, salvation is simple. We know salvation is simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. And people say, well, then, how is it possible? How is it possible for someone to be rejected? I mean, if salvation is so simple, what happens if, if, if Herod would just believe on Jesus? Wouldn't he be saved then? Yes, he would. Anybody that puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ would be saved. But here's the key. Here's the key to understanding someone who has been rejected by God is that God makes it impossible for that person to believe. That they no longer even have that choice. It's no longer... God hardens their heart to the point, just like he did with Pharaoh. And if you remember with Moses and all of the plagues that were coming. And, and as you read, like the plagues get worse and worse and worse. You think it's dark. He's sending the, the, the locusts and the flies and the frogs and, and, and all of these things. And it's causing so much damage and it's just so bad on everyone in the country. It's like, what's wrong with you? Like, have you lost your mind that you're letting all these things happen? Well, the reason why it happened is because God hardened his heart. Now, at first, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And he said, no. And he said, no. And he said, no. Who is the Lord? Who is God? I'm not going to let you go serve God. I'm not going to have anything to do with him. I don't care who God is. I've got my own gods. He hardened his own heart. And then it got to the point where he said, God said, you know what? I'm going to harden his heart. So then even, even at the worst events where everyone else is saying, look, Pharaoh, let them go. We don't want to deal with this anymore. This is obviously coming from God. He still hardened his heart. So there's an example. He couldn't do it. But John chapter 12, we'll see proof. We'll see evidence here. Verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, just as Moses had done so many miracles before Pharaoh, keep that in mind, but though he had done, Jesus Christ had done so many miracles before them, this is a question that you ought to be asking yourself. When Jesus was walking around on this earth, he's healing the sick. He even raised the dead. He, he walked on water. He did all these things. Why did anyone reject him? I mean, look at all the stuff he was capable of. I mean, it was obviously from God. Why did people reject him? Well, let's read here. Though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, verse 39 is key, therefore they could 
not believe. Because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Their heart was hardened by God and they could not believe. And that's, that's the understanding of what a reprobate is, is that there are people who get to the point where they have rejected God. They had the knowledge of God. They knew who God was, but they glorified Him not as God, as Romans 1 says. But they became vain in their own imaginations. They built up their own gods. They worship and serve the creature more than the Creator is blessed forever. Amen. And they get to the point to where God hardens them and says, you know what? Salvation is extremely simple. It's just by believing. And now I'm going to make it so you can't even believe. And their heart is hardened. And um, we see that here in Proverbs chapter 1. And this is some wisdom and instruction that we need to receive. All the more reason why it's important to preach the gospel of Christ to everybody with urgency. Not to just say, well, I'm going to put it off. Well, I'm going to wait. Maybe next year I'll bring it up to my, to my family or to my friends. Maybe I'll tell them about Christ later. You need to do this right away. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. This is, this is for right now. Every moment that you have ought not to be wasted. Flip back if you would to Proverbs chapter 1. We'll finish up the chapter. Proverbs 1 verse number 29. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. It's our choice. You could fear Him not. You could, you, could, you could begin to get that wisdom. You could understand. You could choose to believe on God. It's up to you. But he says, They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. I've told them they were wrong. I've tried to give them counsel. I've tried to tell them. I sent messengers. I told them. But they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Therefore, verse 31, Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. It's going to destroy them. It's going to kill them. And the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. It's the wealth, the prosperity. That's what they wanted. That's what they cared about. More than God was just getting rich. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Say, so if you just listen to my words, listen to this instruction, it'll go well with you. And hopefully you'll, you'll listen to the instruction of God's word. Every day of your life, go home, read this book, read the book of Proverbs, come back next week, we'll be in Proverbs chapter 2, we'll get some more wisdom and understanding so that we can be quiet from fear of evil. We can live a joyful life. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen to us. And we could be doing what's right in the sight of the Lord. Let's bow our heads at a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this wisdom and instruction, dear God. I pray that you would please help us all to have soft hearts, to, to have hearts that truly do love you and want to hear from you and are willing to change our lives. Whatever, whatever we're doing that's wrong, dear God, we just ask that you would help us to understand it and point it out to us. We have your words here for us. You've given it to us already. We don't have to be seeking it out. It's right here. But we pray that you would please give us the understanding and that we might be able to uh, start making the changes in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.